let me start by talking to you about something that has captured the headlines overnight, and I know you've spent a large part of your day clarifying that. What is the reason behind the charges that you've brought in? I know you've clarified that these charges don't impact you and me, i.e. the consumer. It is yeah. at the merchant's end that the charge applies. But explain to me the reason behind this, and I'll also tell you the fear in the mind of the customer, that this is only the start, that this is the start of charges being imposed on consumers for using UPI. The other fear is, look, Consumer will have to pay one way or the other. The merchant will, in a way, get the consumer to pay. So I want you to clarify on the rationale behind these charges and whether this could lead to more such kind of charges. So first of all, Shireen, uh, you know, there are two uh, entities which, uh, which are actually taking part in the merchant payments. One is the customer and second is the merchant. And obviously there is a P2M, which is person to merchant and person to person transa transactions in uh, UPI or any other payment system. So one thing is very clear that customer never pays for any payment transaction, right? Whether it's a peer-to-peer -peer or peer-to-merchant. Always merchant as a user of the payment system pays the nominal reasonable charges for the payment system. So that's the first principle. The second point is the UPI for the bank account, uh, using the bank account, is already uh, free with the, with the government uh, notification. And again, if there is a review, if there is a change, again, the government will have to decide on the next course on that. The, the notification which we issued was pertaining to the prepaid wallets, right? Yeah. Because with the RBI guideline, the wallets are now interoperable. And while they were already operating on the cards, they were not permitted in UPI. So to permit them in UPI, the interchange was permitted. So that's, I think, a nutshell clarified situation. Again, there as well, only the merchant pays, the consumer doesn't pay anything. You, you've made that amply clear, uh, not just here on the Rising India stage, but even in the NPCI press release that came out this morning, clarifying that the consumer doesn't need to pay. Yeah. But the larger question is, Dilip, when we're talking about moving to a billion uh, transactions, uh, you know, which is what the aspiration is for you, you're anticipating a 10x growth from here by 2030. Someone's got to pay. Yeah. Uh, how do you, who is going to invest? Where do you get the money from? So, uh, so uh, again, it's a great question, and uh, you know, today as we stand, you rightly said the near-term goal, which is next two years to three years, we are looking at a billion transactions. We are at 30 crore on a daily basis, uh, uh, the peak transaction. That does and deserve a round of applause, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, 30 crore transactions. And it's all made in India, operated by India for the citizens. I think it's a, it's a great uh, uh, beginning, I must say that. It's not, the, it's not the end. We still have to grow 10x. So I, I think when we look at a billion a day or 10x growth, which is the the three billion per day, which is the true potential of India, you are right, I think we need money, we need investments both on the customer side because uh, there are 600 million eligible customers who can actually come inside the digital payments who are outside today. There are another 100 million merchants who are outside the digital payments who, who can come inside. So I think it is gonna need money. Uh, you know, as on date, uh, you know, the government is uh, kind of giving the digital payment incentive uh, to, the, to the ecosystem and and there is a dialogue with the with the ecosystem and the government, uh, the stakeholders. That you know, how do we how do we grow UPI to 10x now? And how do we ensure that the awareness, education, the the whole consumer and merchant onboarding for the large number uh, takes place? Uh, you know, even if we don't do anything, Nishirin, it will happen in next 10 to 15 years time. Now the question is, can we do this by 2030? I think that's the question which we are looking at. And and I think it's an issue which is, which is under discussion. So let's see how, how it progresses. As of now, the government is paying the incentives and ecosystem is, is, is still trying to look at a very positive, with a very positive outlook that, you know, we need, to, we need more investments. Banks, fintechs, yeah. everybody. That is the reality. We need more investments. I'd, if I'd, the consumer is not going to pay, uh, who does, Mr. Subramaniam? I'd like to add a point, you know. I think everybody remembers. Uh, flying in India was supposed to be a rich man's fancy. And you remember Captain Gopinath came with Deccan Aviation, and then he said, we'll sell tickets for one rupee. It changed people's mindsets. Today, everybody thinks of flying as an alternative to railways, irrespective of what their income levels are. I think the same thing with UPI. In the initial years, you need to promote, you need to see that it becomes a habit. And then once the ecosystem is large enough, and large enough not just domestically, but that you're able to compete globally, because there are alternative payment systems, you should be able to be strong enough to take them on. At that point, one can think of other ways, but in the initial years, all technologies need to be sustained with some degree of support. 
Yes, that support, uh, you, as you put it, is, uh, is understood. But you know, you talked about the global aspiration. Let me get each one of you to comment on that. And Dilip, I'll start by asking you. Uh, you know, the, the plans to globalize UPI, an initial beginning has been made with the pact that's been struck with Singapore and India. Uh, I know that you believe that this could be the model, this could be the template for what we could do with other countries. What's the appetite? You are going to be speaking. Dilip is on his way to the G20 Sherpa meeting in Kumarakom. He's going to be speaking there. This is one of the priorities that the Indian government has set out as part of the G20 presidency. I mean, how quickly do you believe UPI can truly globalize? So, uh, Shirin, uh, the Prime Minister's vision and again the government, RBI, all are working towards the way India is self-sufficient on the payments uh, for the domestically. I think next 10 to 20 years time, a long, long uh, vision is to be self-sufficient on the cross-border uh, pipes as well. And, uh, and it's a time-consuming process, but the, the, the beginning has been made with the, with the Singapore-India corridor. I think in 30 seconds, uh, one country's bank account can be debited and another country's bank account can be created with all forex conversions, the compliances, the checks, AML, all CFT. I, I think this is, I think the Singapore model has uh, given that confidence to the world in my assessment that in 30 seconds, two, con two bank accounts in two different countries can transact. I think this is just a beginning and I, uh, the RBI, the, the MEA, uh, the, the government is also helping us to, uh, to reach out to the other central banks and uh, you know, their agencies to, to create this cross-border pipes. It's a, it's a long journey, but I think, I, I think the, everybody's committed to make this happen. We, you know, we'll have to look at an investment approach, right? Because you know, the transaction will take longer time to pick up to the level what you're looking at. But, but I think the outlook is outstanding, $100 billion remittance we get on a, on a yearly basis. Plus, we have a huge travel uh, yeah. now for out of, outbound to, uh, from India. So I think it's a, it's a great story. We'll have to keep doing this. So in the next five years, what would you believe we could, where, where could we be as far as globalization is concerned? So I, I, I think, you know, I, you know, it may not be a very, uh, very wrong to say that, you know, at least a few countries utilizing the India's payment stack, right? Prime Minister said that India's public good can be the public good of the world. Uh, similarly, the, having the cross-border pipes with at least 15 uh, top countries out of 30 to have the self-sufficient cross-border pipes to process remittances and payments. Well, and that's a vision we are looking at. Well, you know, it's not going to be an easy road, as you know. Absolutely. But, but, uh, but that, that is the vision, and it's an aspirational vision, is that. You know, the, Mr. Subramaniam, since we're talking about what is going to be the next layer of innovation, uh, especially in the context of the priorities of a development state, uh, accountability, efficiency, transparency, where do you believe we currently stand on that front? And how important do you think it is going to be in this era for India to really have a robust law, data protection and data privacy law, which we don't currently? I think on the data protection law, you, you've seen the statements of the minister. I think the act is in the final stages. I think probably in the monsoon session, you'll have the act coming up. They've had public consultation. I think it's a forward-looking act. And I think uh, the concerns of industry as well as uh, stakeholders have been taken on board. So I think that's something that's going to be coming up. I think the biggest thing they're going to keep in mind that India is a great provider of digital technologies and software around the world. And so we shouldn't harm that either. So I think as one reads it and one is uh, privy to some of the discussions that are going on, we will have a forward-leaning uh, data protection law, which will also ensure that are existing businesses which are there in the country. And India is a major services uh, producer, both domestically and internationally, that without that being heard, adequate data protection is there for the individual. Coming back to the other question, where do you see the development trajectory going, etc.? I will limit myself again to digital public infrastructure. I think this is one area where India is actually playing the role of a disruptor globally. And I think that's very important. We could have flown along with the tide and then done what everybody else is doing. I think it's very interesting that India is actually poking its nose, creating waves, breaking up existing patterns, creating new architectures, which is allowing our own firms to piggyback on that public architecture and come up with new solutions, new technologies, new applications. Give, give me examples of this poking nose disruption that you speak no, of. It's, it's, it's very clear. I mean, 
I will begin one by one. L look at Aadhaar, the identity. I mean, uh, the day is not far away when we are going to sell Aadhaar as an identity globally. I mean, it is quite possible to do that. We already have, I think, about uh, seven to eight crore people outside India who use digital identities using our work. So I think this is going to, and instead of having 200 passwords, I mean, this could be a digital identity. Estonia is probably selling digital identity globally, but they're in a couple of million. Look at our size and scale, and we have proved that it works. Look at what um, um, uh, UPI is doing. I mean, I'm actually a bit more ambitious than NSPCL in the sense that when I'm not going to look at it as something which is just cross-border 30 countries or 15 countries. I foresee this as a major challenge to what existing financial transaction systems globally are. This is going to be a threat to SWIFT. This is going to be a threat to other payment systems around the world. I mean, it's not impossible that 15, 20 years down the road, the UPI model becomes the basic payment model around the world within countries for their own internal financial transactions. And where India benefits from that is, being the thought leader in this, it's our firms which will have the products which will then be universally applicable. One of the complaints against the Indian software sector is that we provide you know, white labor, we are basically doing back office work, and we don't develop products. The advantage of this, and the third one, the account aggregator framework, which RBI has developed. In a way, that is piggybacking on UPI and the digital payment system where you're going to have fintech firms which are going to lend to people not on assets, but on cash flows. I mean, that's a fundamental shift. I mean, uh, a, a telawala on a road doesn't have assets, but he has cash flows, and you can actually lend to people on cash flows. Once you've established that principle, think of how it will explode globally. And so whatever you see, be in Bangalore, Bombay, outside Delhi, these new startups, the unicorns that are coming up, they're not unicorns just for nothing, but they are coming up with business models which are riding on our public architecture, which tomorrow I foresee as at least half or more than half of them being global standard. And building on what um, uh, NSPC, UPI is doing, what India should be doing is after having established the proof of concept on scale in India, we need to set global standards. And the day that happens, you will see that Indian standards means more Indian created stuff, be it products or um, uh, technologies spreading around the world. I think that's the game of the future. Are we going to get into standard making? And I think we are on the way. And that's where the G20 will help. Well, uh, gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very, very much for joining us here at the Rising India Summit, for giving us a sense of what the government's priorities are when it uh, comes to digital India. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Mr. Subramaniam as well as Mr. Raja Raman. Thank you very much for your time.